everyone, and welcome back to the introduction to lithic analysis with Save Cultural Heritage Group. Uh, this is week four. Uh, we're going to start talking about different stone tool technologies that are represented in the archaeological record, specifically that of the Paleolithic and the Stone Age. So um, we're going to skip the review this week and just dive in. So if you have any questions about the lecture from last week, please reach out to me and I'd love to help you. So now that we're looking at the archaeological record of stone tools, we can start to apply what we have learned about flint knapping and stone tool analysis in more practical contexts. Uh, we're going to start with the earliest technologies, moving on to the more recent tools. So we have a clear view of the technological progression of lithic industries through time. To begin, we're looking at the Lower Paleolithic, which is also known as the Early Stone Age, with terminology varying regionally. So the Lower Paleolithic uh, usually refers to Eurasia, whereas the Early Stone Age uh, refers to Africa. Um, these are the oldest stone tools currently known to exist, um, and they correspond with early hominins. Uh, we've discussed the older one a little bit in previous lectures, but this time we're going a little bit further back. So a few years ago in 2015, a discovery was made at the Lomekwi 3 site near Lake Turkana, uh, and this changed our perception of stone tool antiquity. Um, so here, stone tools even older than the old one were discovered. Um, these were determined to be technologically different from the old one. They were classed uh, as a new industry called the Lamequian, and they've been dated to approximately 3.3 million years ago. Uh, so that's almost a million years before the old one. So these are uh, pretty significant. Um, at the Lamequi site, stone tools were discovered in situ, eroding from a slope, so they were preserved by a series of sediment deposits that have just eroded over time, leaving the stone tools in the place that they were deposited in. And these tools uh, exhibit possible evidence of bipolar napping techniques presented through chipping marks on two faces of the core, as well as um, uh, extra chipping marks on the napping platform of the flakes found. And um, the other uh, features of these stone tools are pecking marks, which suggests also potentially processing of organic materials such as nuts. So here we uh, can assess that these Hominins were doing bipolar napping, resting the core on an anvil, and then striking it with the hammer stone. Overall, the Lamequi site shows an understanding of conchoidal fracture in material and evidence of raw material selectivity for this reason. And it also indicates um, an inability to foresee and avoid napping accidents and a lack of retouched material, which indicates that uh, while these hominids did have the ability to determine what material would fracture in the way that needed to, they lacked the, um, the motor ability or the cognitive ability to avoid creating napping accidents. So a lot of napping accidents are present in the Lamequian. Uh, these tools were found in spatial and chronological association with hominin fossils and are thus attributed to Kenyanthropus, which is an early hominin. Uh, it's got a relatively small cranial capacity, 450 uh, cc. But um, other supporting evidence for this early development of stone tools uh, corresponds with another site, the Dakika site, where a series of um, bones with potential cut marks were found. Uh, however, neither lithics nor hominin fossils were found in association with these cut marked bones. So there's a little bit of speculation about how accurate this is. Um, the, Lamequian, blah, 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 the Lamequian site itself is still a topic of debate as well uh, because of the taphonomy. Some argue that it's not necessarily as reliable as it could be. So hopefully we'll see some more of this in the future. 
And now revisiting the older one, uh, we already know that this is the next tool industry following the Lamequian. As mentioned previously, uh, it's considered to be a mode one tool technology with more developed modes following in the subsequent uh, periods. Mode one is classified by flaking. And so this mode focuses on the production of many flaked pieces through simple flake removals by freehand and direct percussion methods uh, using hard hammers and anvils and so on. Uh, in some instances, organized flaking can be observed in which reduction follows a stable pattern, but most often the reduction sequence seems to be randomized. Uh, the primarily uh, the primary goal of the older one was to produce flakes uh, with no intention to shape the core into a specific form. So this focused only on the simple removal of flakes following no predetermined shape. It has for a long time been considered the oldest stone tool technology and it's characterized as we already know by crude roughly shaped core and flake tools. The most common form is the multi-purpose pebble chopper, which you can see here in this image. Uh, it was discovered by the Leakies, as we've mentioned previously, at Olduvai Gorge in the 1930s, and it has continuously been studied since then, so we're always learning a little bit more about the older one. Uh, but the most common materials used are quartz, quartzite, and basalt, which uh, alone indicates a sort of raw material selectivity process. Bone tools were also likely common as well, but there are only rare instances of worked bone fragments. Um, overall, there are two different tool types, um, being battering and cutting tools. Battering tools were likely used for processing acts, such as marrow extraction or plant exploitation, whereas cutting tools were used to process animal remains. There's also an interesting debate related to the older one industry, which I'm only going to briefly mention. I'm not going to explore it too much because it can get kind of convoluted and we're going to focus our time on other topics. Uh, originally presented by Louis Leakey, the uh, idea we're going to talk about is that of the developed older one. So Leakey presented this idea as being an evolution of technology, specifically at Olduvai, representing an in situ evolution of technology and hominids visible through the lithic and archaeological record. Uh, this idea is somewhat useful in interpreting the distinctions between different chronological levels at Olduvai. It also adds uh, kind of unnecessary complexities to interpreting the lithic industries. And uh, for that reason, we're not really going to get into it too much. It is really interesting, so I encourage you to look into it more if you are curious. But for now, that's all we're going to discuss in this course. Despite the relative simplicity of Oldowan tool technology, there are some interesting characteristics when considering site variability. Uh, the oldest Oldowan material so far comes from Gona, Ethiopia, which is dated to uh, about 2.6 million years ago. Uh, while there are similar techniques and skill levels present at the site, there also appear to be instances of differential exploitation strategies when looking across the assemblages. Uh, of particular interest at this site is the presence of manuports, which are specific raw material pieces brought in intentionally by the hominins for napping purposes. Uh, this indicates a really high degree of raw material selection, so that's really interesting to consider. Um, by looking at these three sites, the Gona, Lokoleli, and Omo sites, we can see that material selection is of really high importance to the tool producers. Uh, the variability in exploitation strategies also expresses a developed technical understanding of napping processes, as well as direct intentionality in regard to production methods. There's also a clear adherence to rules and conventions, suggesting the possible transmission of ideas and concepts. The next technology we're looking at is classified as Mode 2, and it's also known as the Acheulean industry. Uh, this corresponds with the Lower Paleolithic and the Early Stone Age as well, uh, spanning from about 1.7 million years ago to about 800,000 years ago. 
So uh, mode two is defined by shaping and retouching rather than simple flaking. Uh, and later on towards the end of the Acheulean, uh, soft hammer use. The main difference between mode two and mode one includes the intentional modification of a blank to create a specific tool form. Uh, this is most commonly associated with Homo erectus, but this technique and this tool type continues also uh, to be used by Homo sapiens and Neanderthal as well. Uh, the Acheulean industry is defined by uh, the presence of large cutting tools, uh, which are generally referred to as LCTs. These are relatively uniform, bifacially worked hand axes. Uh, other common types of tools in the Acheulean include cleavers, which possess a wide distal cutting edge and are used for cutting or chopping, and picks, which are flaked on three surfaces and possess a triangular cross section. Uh, and as we mentioned previously, uh, for the old one, the high levels of raw material selectivity that continues into the Acheulean as well. We know that the main feature of the Acheulean is the structured removal of flakes to make a tool of a predetermined shape presented as the hand axe. Similar to our discussion about the developed versus classical older one, the Acheulean can also often be divided into earlier periods as well, uh, sometimes referred to as the Chilean period, which is defined by less refined hand axes, followed by the actual Acheulean, which consists of more refined hand axes. Um, however, we'll be classifying all of these together simply as the Acheulean, but I did want to mention the possibility of differentiation. Uh, these characteristic Acheulean hand axes are bifacially worked flakes or cobbles with bilateral symmetry and a distinguishable tip and butt. Uh, compared to the flaked tools of the older one, they ap these uh, appear highly specialized. And also of note is the general idea that to produce such a tool, the creator requires a mental template before the production begins, indicating an advanced stage of premeditation and understanding of cause and effect. The Acheulean is the longest spanning technology, remaining largely unchanged in general composition. However, there is some chronological variation present, as mentioned previously, with more refined pieces being present more recently and less refined pieces being older. Uh, there's a general separation here uh, between the early Acheulean and the late Acheulean being um, the early Acheulean has cruder bifaces with less attention to symmetry. Um, normally the pieces are minimally shaped and uh, sometimes there's, you know, the general characterization is that there's less than 10 flake removals uh, with a lot of overlap with corn flake technology. And in the late Acheulean, the bifaces are highly shaped with um, extensive symmetry and more standardized tool shapes, as well as clear use of soft hammer technology and a wider range of behaviors represented. The next technology we're going to address is mode three, which falls under the Middle Paleolithic and Middle Stone Age umbrella. Um, this most commonly corresponds with the Mousterian. Mode three is generally defined by prepared core technology, which we've seen before presented as level odd reduction strategies. Um, these are often considered to be the hallmark of the Mousterian, but they're not necessarily present in all uh, Middle Stone Age or Mousterian assemblages. Uh, and mode three tends to indicate an increased complexity in tool production, along with the development of finer retouch, um, the introduction of heat treatment and hafting technology, as well as bone tools. Uh, if you're not familiar with hafting technology, that is composite tools where you would construct a tool utilizing multiple parts, often being a spear or an arrow, where you take the lithic point and utilizing the wood shaft or bone shaft, you would attach the two together with an adhesive of some sort. Uh, as with other technologies, there is regional and chronological variability present. Um, there are differing ideas about the cause of the variability among Mousterian types. 
For example, Francois Board believed the variation stemmed from cultural differences, whereas Binford argued that the differences were functional, and Mailers argued that the variation was chronicle, uh, chronological. Uh, Dibble argues also that the variation is based on reduction or rejuvenation of pieces. Uh, it's likely that there's no singular case, but that the variation is influenced by all of these flat factors in combination, as well as other environmental and cultural conditions. As we've seen before, the nappers of mode three tools were highly selective of raw material. Here especially though, we see the nappers are seeking out high quality raw materials such as fine grained quartzites and flint, uh, as well as obsidian. There's also a clear selection for flat blocks and nodules, which allowed for a greater volumetric control, control of the material. Uh, materials were selected based on their ability to be shaped into the needed form, allowing for uniform preparation. As we've seen before, um, the preparation of a core is incredibly important for the level reduction technique, and so core selection was highly important here. Since we've talked about the level law technique before, I hope you're comfortable with these concepts already. Um, so as we know, the level law technique is designed to produce a flake of predetermined size and shape following intensive core preparation, which is why material selectivity is so important here. Uh, there are two different level law reduction strategies, lineal, which is sometimes al also called preferential, and recurrent, which is sometimes also called multiple. On lineal reduction, uh, you produce a single large pre-shaped flake after extensive core preparation, whereas in recurrent reduction, um, the process allows for the removal of several flakes from the prepared core before reshaping must occur. Both of these methods require radial flake removal from the surface of the core as preparation for flake removal, which results in preferential flake removal, highly faceted platforms, and highly distinctive radial dorsal scar patterns, which we can observe on the flakes. And in addition to these very specialized predetermined flakes, there are also a number of other tool types associated with the Mousterian as well. In fact, uh, Francois Bord defined over 63 different flake tool types for the Mousterian, including a variety of side scrapers, end scrapers, denticulates, and notched pieces. Uh, these different tool forms correspond with changing and diversifying behaviors through time, many of which only begin to present themselves in the Middle Paleolithic Middle Stone Age. Uh, there are differing ideas about the cause of this variability. Uh, as we mentioned before, uh, likely it stems from a series of causation uh, driven by both environmental and cultural conditions. Next, we have mode four, which corresponds with the Upper Paleolithic and the Late Stone Age. Classically, this is characterized by the widespread appearance of blades and blade technology, with a blade being defined as a flake that is at least twice as long as it is wide. Here we see a particularly high degree of variation, especially when compared to the late Paleo or lower Paleolithic and the middle Paleolithic. And we also see extensive diversification of technologies over relatively short periods of time. After about 40,000 years ago, lithic assemblages varied a lot, both geographically and chronologically. So along with the widespread appearance of blades, we also see bladelets, backing, hafting, projectiles, uh, increases in bone and antler tools, um, higher standard, standardization of tool categories, as well as personal ornamentation and the appearance of art. The first industry we're talking about from the Upper Paleolithic is going to be the Aurignacian, uh, controversially as well the Chateau Peronian, uh, which we're not going to discuss. I'll just briefly mention it here as being roughly contemporaneous with the Aurignacian. However, Chateau Peronian is often found in contexts associated with Neanderthals and is thus potentially linked to Neanderthals. There's an ongoing debate about this as well, uh, and the Potential idea is that Chateau Peronian is emulation uh, from Neanderthals on the Aurignacian technology that the Homo sapiens brought in during their dispersal into Europe. 
So the Aurignacian technology appears between about 40,000 uh, years ago and terminates at about 28,000 years ago. It's characterized by large, thick blades uh, with scalar retouch, beaked burins, and then also nosed and carinated end scrapers, as well as split based bone and antler points. As with some of the other industries we've talked about, there's a little bit of a chronological debate going on with a separate classification of the early Aurignacian assemblages being referred to as Proto-Aurignacian. Uh, this time period also corresponds with some of the earliest instances of art production, including the very well-known Chauvet cave drawings. Uh, mobiliary art also makes an appearance here, represented by uh, objects such as the Venus of Hohfels and the Lohenmensch figurine or the Lion Man figurine. Uh, the Lion Man figurine is also the earliest piece of anthropomorphic imagery found to date, so there's a lot of stuff going on during this period. Following the Aurignacian, we see the Gravettian, which uh, corresponds to about 28,000 to 21,000 years ago. Um, in the Gravettian, we find parallel edged pointed blades, backed blades and backed bladelets, uh, as well as tanged and stemmed points and shouldered points. A lot of the tool form variation here is regional, uh, as seen with distinctions found between Western Europe and Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, so that's interesting to consider. Um, along with the Aurignacian, here we also find some unique instances of art, specifically the expansive presence of Venus figurines. Following the Gravettian, we have the Salutrian, which is present from about 21,000 to about 16,000 years ago. Uh, and the Salutrian is a very highly specialized tool industry focusing on large, very finely shaped uh, leaf shaped points. Uh, what's particularly unique here is the focus on pressure flaking rather than hard or soft hammer percussion. This technique allows for the extreme precision which made creating these points possible. Following the Salutrian, we have the Magdalenian, which also presents uh, the first real instances of Mode 5 technologies. The Magdalenian period is associated with the time frame from about 16.5 to about 11,000 years ago, and it's the terminal stage of the Upper Paleolithic, uh, transitioning into the Mesolithic. The defining tool types here uh, corresponding with mode five techno type is uh, microlithic technology or blades and micro bladelets. Um, also common are a wide range of burins uh, and expansive bone and antler technology, including the development of harpoons. Uh, mobiliary art is also a defining characteristic uh, here as well. And uh, technologically, the Mesolithic is relatively similar to the Magdalenian, so uh, we're going to lump them together and I won't be discussing the Mesolithic further here. And finally, we reach the Neolithic. Uh, this period is defined by a switch to sedentism and domestication as primary ways of life. Along with these drastic changes, uh, we also see a change in the technological repertoire to reflect these um, lifestyle changes. And while lithics from the previous technological types are still present, such as microliths and finally worked by faces, we also see the appearance of stone adzes, which are used for large scale plant processing uh, for resource exploitation related to housing and farm development. And that's all for this week. I know it's been a very quick overview of the Paleolithic Stone Age and Lithic record, but hopefully that gives you an idea of the development of Lithic strategies through time. And as always, if you have any questions or want any more information, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, next week, we'll be talking about site and artifact interpretation. So uh, looking forward to talking to you more then.